hopes of, of one day getting cerebral phenomena such that I can put them into mathematical equations. Um, I hope to bequeath to the generations a calculus of the nervous system. Now this was a pretty high ambition um, for 200 years ago um, and even today uh, we really struggle to get our understanding of, of, of the brain and mental phenomena um, into a form that we can really call a scientific understanding. Um, coming a, a bit closer to today, uh, I'm from Manchester and about a mile and a half from where I live there's this fairly um, uh, non-distinct house uh, on, on about 10 miles south of the middle of Manchester and uh, this house is uh, a unique uh, role in the history of computing is it's where Alan Turing lived uh, when he came to Manchester towards the end of his career uh, because Manchester had built the first operational machine to implement his big idea from the 1930s of the universal computing machine and uh, while he was in Manchester uh, Turing worked on a number of topics but perhaps the most interesting um, to this discussion was the paper that he published on computing machinery and intelligence um, in which he starts by saying I propose to consider the question can machines think and in this paper he goes on to develop a proposal for a test for machines that have human-like intelligence and he calls that test the imitation game and of course we simply know it as the Turing test for human-like artificial intelligence and in this paper Turing reckons that all a machine needs compared with the Manchester baby machine that he came to Manchester to use all it needed relative to that machine was more memory and in this paper he reckons that to imitate human intelligence, a machine would need about a gigabyte of memory. And he forecast that machines might have that much memory by the end of the century. This is the 20th century. Um, and uh, that was a pretty remarkable extrapolation when you consider that the Manchester baby machine had 128 bytes of memory, um, 128 bytes to hold the code and the data. Um, and he was extrapolating to a gigabyte, but in fact, it turned out that at the end of the century, uh, that really was about the time when a typical PC on your desk would have around a gigabyte of memory. It would also be about a million times faster than the Manchester baby. So it would have the amount of memory Turing thought was necessary. It would be about a million times faster, but it would not pass his test. And I think uh, Turing would have been very surprised by that. And, and my personal take on why uh, programming computers to display human-like intelligence has proved much harder than Turing and many people since Turing have thought uh, is because we don't understand natural intelligence. And we, we don't understand natural intelligence because that's grounded in the brain. And we simply still are a long way from having a reasonable explanation of how the brain does its job as an information processing system. So the research that I've been leading for the last 20 years at Manchester has been motivated by these two high level questions. We now have formidable computing power available to us. Can we use that to contribute to the grand challenge of understanding how the brain does its job? And as we do learn more about the brain, and we are always adding to our knowledge of the brain, uh, can we use that knowledge to work out how to build better computers for some value of the word better? Now, while I've been embarked on this quest with my group in Manchester and many collaborators uh, in Europe and around the world, of course, um, the outside world has been changing pr pretty rapidly too. And particularly over the last 10 years, there's been this explosion of interest in mainstream artificial intelligence based on neural nets, which are rather different from the neural nets that we are concerned with with Spinnaker. And uh, a canonical um, industrial net is something uh, that I've shown in simple form here. This is a convolutional net. And the typical job here is you show it an image at the left hand side. This is typically a picture of something, oh, I think a cat is the strong favorite here. 
Um, and then this image is processed from left to right through many different layers of artificial neurons. And at the right hand end, there's uh, a classification layer that comes out and says it's a cat. Or if the classification layer says it's a dog, that's, a, that's an error. And you feed the error back in at the right hand end and you go back through the network to the left using a technique called backpropagation and you adjust a million parameters on your way until it says it's a cat. Um, and then you do this for enough images and the network will become pretty good at uh, approaching human level performance or perhaps even exceeding it on you know, recognizing animals and deciding which ones are cats. And with the first example of this from Google, I believe the network having been shown about 10 million images uh, got pretty good at recognizing cats. And I compare that with my two-year-old grandson who, when he's seen one cat, will recognize cats robustly and reliably for the rest of his life. Um, so there's a big difference between how these industrial networks learn and how much information they need to learn and what a biological system exemplified in this case by my two-year-old grandson uh, can achieve. Of course, it's not really a fair comparison because the Google Net starts with its network completely scrambled, uh, whereas my two-year-old grandson starts with two years experience of the world into which cats fit rather nicely. Um, but even so, I think there is still something fundamentally different about how biological systems learn from small data sets when they have to and, and the very large data sets required to train commercial networks. Now, if we look at that network with information flowing uh, relatively simply from left to right, and we compare that with a fairly simplified image of a biological network, in this case, this is a, a small area of cortex, then uh, there are a number of striking differences. Uh, firstly, the biological network um, uses spikes as its primary communication mechanism whereas the artificial net propagates continuous values. But even more striking is that, unlike the artificial net, which took inputs in at the left and fed outputs out at the right, the biological system receives inputs at, at different places from different sources, and it generates outputs to different places at different levels. And internally, uh, there's very complex uh, to and froing uh, and feedback of information. Um, now, this is a complex picture, even when simplified to the degree shown here. Um, and we still fundamentally don't understand what's going on in this picture. Um, but somehow the secrets of how the biology works are embedded in this picture or something related to it. If you look at the computational requirements, then uh, the machine of choice for uh, modeling those artificial nets uh, that are dominant in industrial AI is uh, the GPU. Uh, this example from NVIDIA uses about three kilowatts of power. It's very good at dense matrix multiplications, um, which is uh, the foundation of how it handles these artificial nets. And uh, increasingly, we're learning how to use lower precision arithmetic uh, to optimize and improve the network models. Um, but basically, this is a fairly power hungry solution and the cost of training an artificial net on large data sets in, in, in data centers with this kind of equipment is, is a serious obstacle to their wider use. If we go to spiking networks that more closely resemble biology, then the standard off the shelf machine of choice uh, looks something like this. Um, these are machines now which can handle sparse matrix operations capturing the sparse connectivity of the biology um, quite effectively. Um, they can communicate using spikes, uh, but now the power consumption has gone from kilowatts up into the megawatt region for machines such as this. Um, however, there are more bespoke technologies being built to handle spiking nets more efficiently. Uh, the example shown here is, is the IBM True North chip and the characteristics of these architectures are that they uh, keep the memory that's, that's used very close to the computation that's being performed on the information in that memory. 
And now we can see we can run at much lower powers, we can maintain real time, which actually isn't practical even in the supercomputers with spiking networks. And the power has gone from megawatts in this case down to milliwatts. So we're seeing huge ranges of, of, of variability of the power of the different solutions to these different sorts of neural network. Um, and this ought to be leading somewhere interesting. Now the neuromorphic technologies which, which support these spiking nets efficiently um, are attracting growing interest and we see big companies investing in these. Um, I've mentioned IBM already with their True North chip. Uh, more recently Intel has joined the fray with its low heat chip which is a formidable piece of silicon for handling spiking neural networks. And there are startup companies such as Innovation out of ETH Zurich, Chronicam out of the Paris Vision Institute and in Manchester uh, we have a startup that, that's uh, been developing event-based AI using our Spinnaker system as its development platform. Um, so you can see both venture capital and big industry money going into this, um, although to date there is no compelling demonstration that this technology actually delivers something of of, of significant added value to industry. It's still a research territory and Intel's low EHE chip, for instance, isn't a product. It's a, it's a research prototype and they're using it to explore the prospective market. They're pushing the chip out into academic groups around the world and waiting to see if somebody comes up with some uh, magical use of this chip that demonstrates its commercial viability. And I think they're looking uh, to find that kind of evidence before they commit the huge resources required to turn a new chip um, into a significant product. Now what have we been doing in Manchester? Well um, it was in the title of the talk so it was no surprise uh, our approach in Manchester has been uh, this thing called the Spinnaker Project and we started off um, nearly 20 years ago now asking ourselves what could we do if we put a million small processors in a box and connected them together so they could support real-time biological models. And at the outset it was clear that even with a million mobile phone processors you don't get close to the scale of the human brain. Um, then we thought we could get to about 1% of the human brain. Um, today I would say I think that's a bit of an overestimate. Um, but if you take 1% of the human brain, that's about the, sa the same as 10 whole mice. Uh, the mouse brain is conveniently very similar to the human brain, but a thousand times smaller. Um, today, I would probably say that realistically, we, can, we should be able to model one whole mouse brain in biological real time. Um, so the 10 was somewhat of an overestimate, but uh, it's still within tolerance. Now what's in the Spinnaker machine? Well, um, at one level it looks like a fairly conventional massively parallel computer. It's an assembly of compute nodes and these are connected uh, through a 2D mesh. Um, and each node in this compute mesh contains two chips, the Spinnaker chip or the compute layer um, that we designed in Manchester at the outset of the project and an industry standard DRAM um, which is used to hold the large data structures, which in spiking nets means the, the synaptic connectivity matrices. Um, they're held in DRAM. If we look at the chip, so we spent the first five years of the project designing this chip, um, designing even reasonably close to state-of-the-art digital chips in with academic research budgets is quite challenging. Um, the chip is 100 million transistors, it's 130 nanometer CMOS, which was quite old even when we chose it, but we'd set ourselves the target of building a million core computer on a million pound budget. And so we had to look at the cost of everything, including making masks. And if we'd gone for a, a more advanced process technology, then the masks would have eaten the whole budget. Um, on this took about five years and 40 person years of design activity to put together. Uh, at the top left you see a picture of what's inside the package. Uh, the larger lighter coloured square chip is the Spinnaker compute layer and the darker rectangular object on top is the DRAM. 
and the DRAM is simply glued on top of the Spinnaker chip and then the two chips are connected uh, together and into the package by standard gold wire bonding. So it's a sort of two and a half D structure but um, we're not using anything advanced such as um, uh, through die wires. Um, they're just gold wire bonded and then the thing is assembled into the package shown at the bottom left which is two centimeters square and we can effectively tile the world um, or tile any sort of 2D surface with those packages uh, to build a scalable compute architecture. If we look at what's on the chip um, then again most of what you see looks like a conventional um, high performance computing chip except the processors we use are, are quite small. We use thin um, energy efficient processors rather than fat high compute throughput processors and uh, the processor here is somewhere in the light blue area on the upper right side of the slide uh, there's a whole lot of other stuff in there to do with uh, the supporting peripherals and this is all compiled automatically by tools into a sort of the typical spaghetti you get out of such tools uh, but the key feature here is that the memory that that processor uses most of the time is very close. It's in the green areas immediately above and there's 32 kilobytes of code memory, 64 kilobytes of data memory and those are about a millimeter away from the processor. So one, one of my crude models of the power required for a computation is it's the number of bits you have to move multiplied by the distance they move. So for a given computation you optimize by minimizing the distance and uh, the less frequently used data is on that DRAM, which is accessed through the orange RAM port shown on the left hand side. And that's about 10 millimeters away from the processor. And there are 18 copies of that processor with its memory blocks on this chip. That's just the number that fits in a, a sensible size die on the process technology we chose. And um, all of that is fairly conventional. Um, it's connected together through an asynchronous network on chip. Um, and if you like, the, the innovative bit of this chip is the red bit in the middle, and that's the router. That's how we connect those processors together. On Spinnaker, we're optimizing for modeling spiking neural networks. And when a processor that's modeling a particular neuron decides that neuron should emit a spike, um, that spike is represented by a packet that's dropped into a packet switch fabric and that packet then flows around the machine uh, to its destinations and there may be many of them uh, and the real-time constraint is that the packet must be delivered everywhere it has to go within a small fraction of a millisecond uh, to main, maintain biological real-time. So if we look at um, the key to that routing on Spinnaker, um, this is the thing that emerged first when we started thinking about the problem was with the very high connectivity of biology, you know, a neuron typically connects to thousands of other neurons, then having a fundamental multicast routing system uh, is, is essential to achieve that level of connectivity reasonably efficiently. And so on Spinnaker, a spike becomes a packet a packet has an 8-bit header which does housekeeping stuff and a 32-bit key and the key is effectively address event representation. If you're in the neuromorphic business you'll know AER has been widely used since its invention at Caltech in the 1980s and what we've done on Spinnaker is turn AER into a multicast packet routed fabric. The packet can carry data but typically a spike packet won't so a spike is represented by a 40-bit packet and that packet contains no information about where it should go. Um, it contains, typically it contains information uh, about where it's come from. So each neuron that's being modeled uh, can have a unique identifier in the 32-bit space. Uh, there is some possibility of reusing identifiers, but typically we don't need to. Um, and so that routing key basically tells you where the packets come from. And then the router um, has a content addressable memory, which 
uh, looks up that key and when it uh, recognizes it, it um, generates an output from the routing RAM, which has 24 bits. And that tell you, tells you which of the uh, 18 local cores it should go to, and it could go to any or all of them, and which of the uh, neighboring chip links it should go to, and it could go to any or all of the six neighboring chips. So there's a 24 bit RAM, each bit corresponding to a, um, a core or, or a link. Um, and so one input packet can become up to 24 output packets. 24 is not a very useful number, but that's uh, in principle possible. And to make this work, um, a number of optimizations are required. Um, otherwise, the lookup table becomes impossibly large. And uh, one of the optimizations is that the cam that we do the associated lookup in is, is three state. It's a ternary cam. And so we can make any of the bits of the key don't care in the lookup process. So for example, if we have a population of 256 neurons, um, they may, uh, the individual neurons may be numbered in the bottom eight bits of the key and the neuron population may be defined in the top 24 bits. And then we can mask out the bottom eight bits and root all of the neurons in that population using the same single key. Um, and in fact, we, we go quite a long way beyond that. We use quite sophisticated um, logical compression algorithms to uh, generate initially quite large routing tables, which we then compress down to fit into this CAM. Um, there's quite a lot of subtle optimization you can do. And that allows you to route a neuron or a population of neurons across the machine uh, following an arbitrary tree of connections and, and there are a couple of simple examples shown in the diagram on the right, where the source is one of the red uh, chips and the destinations are the one or three yellow things that are connected. Um, and uh, another optimization is that if the ternary cam doesn't recognize the input key, then it passes the packet straight through. So for instance, if we start at one one and we're going to the three yellow packets uh, to the right and a bit above, then we don't need any routing table entries in 2-1 or 3-1. We need one in 4-1 to change the direction of the packet, uh, nothing in 5-2. And then in the yellow destination squares, we need routing table entries to send that packet to the relevant local cores and onto neighboring chips as appropriate. So this slide basically um, summarizes um, the significant innovation in Spinnaker. Um, everything else looks like a conventional uh, massively parallel computer made out of fairly simple processors. Um, it's this the way we handle the packet routing is, uh, is the thing that's different from um, standard massively parallel machines. Now, where are we up to? Um, to program this machine, obviously, um, the code running on it is low level real time, typically written in C running on the ARM cores. Um, our user base, we don't expect to be able to program real time C. Uh, so we start with a high level language called Pine, which has been developed through a series of European projects and is used for a number of different machines. And the user writes a Pine script, and then we have a tool stack that uh, reads in the Pine script and maps the problem onto the machine and sets up the routing tables, loads and runs it, um, feeds stuff in, gets stuff out, and presents results in a way that's reasonably standardized across a range of platforms that support Pine. You can run Pine on your, on your own laptop. If you get a simulator such as Brian, um, then you can run Pine locally. And, and some of our users develop their Pine models that way and then load them onto Spinnaker when they want them to run bigger or faster or something. Um, so the software's absorbed at least as much effort, in fact, probably considerably more effort than the hardware to get uh, to the level of usability that we now have with quite a large number of users um, around the world. So we've got the chip. We can put the chip onto a circuit board and the standard Spinnaker circuit board has 48 chips on. Uh, it may look like it's a square, but the top right hand corner is missing. It's actually a hexagon um, that's been sheared into a square shape for convenience of layout. 
um, but the board is logically a hexagon and the three FPGAs at the top each make two connections to neighbouring boards. So there are, there are six connections to neighbouring boards in total. And the, the, that connectivity is transparent to the application. So the application just sees a 2D array of chips. Um, and you can build arbitrary size machines by wiring those boards together. Um, and we've got this machine in Manchester with 1200 of those boards. That's a million processors our original target that's been online since November 2018. And before that, uh, since March 2016, we've had a half a million core machine up. Um, the number of remote users and Spinnaker jobs is not particularly up to date here. Um, so it, it's physically quite a large machine, uh, remotely accessible um, and in fairly heavy use, the, the, the load factor on the machine, I think, is on average above 25% now, which uh, means there's on average quarter of a million cores in use. Um, it's not the only machine there is. Um, we've been loaning uh, Spinnaker boards um, to various collaborators around the world for the last 10 years. And uh, when we ran out of funds to build boards to loan, we started selling them. Um, and the Spinnaker installations uh, around the planet are sort of summarized in the map on the right here. Um, it, it's not complete, um, but it shows that we've got quite a lot of people using the hardware around the world. And of course, the big machine in Manchester is useful if you want to run a big sort of batch job. Uh, but if you want some real time robotics control, you really need a board that's physically close to the robot. You can't run the real-time robotics with internet latencies. Um, so that's one of the reasons why people like local physical hardware. Um, the smallest board we, we have is the four node board uh, shown at the left of the pictures at the bottom. Uh, the big board is usually shipped in the acrylic packaging um, shown in the middle and then larger systems are assembled in rack cabinets uh, similar to the one on the right. So um, that's the machine. Um, what can it do? Well, um, there are a number of applications. Obviously, the primary target of the machine was to support computational neuroscience. Um, and here, quite a wide range of different brain regions have had models built to run on Spinnaker. Um, one of the more interesting is one that, uh, w that was developed by our Human Brain Project collaborators in Ulich in Germany, uh, which is a quite a detailed cortical model. Uh, it's a model of a, a square millimeter of cortex. It has all the neurons and synapses that you find in a, a square millimeter of cortex. Um, this runs with a 0.1 millisecond time step. And at the beginning of this year, we published the first version of this model that ran in real time. And this was running on Spinnaker, which is uh, faster than uh, the competing platforms have managed to get it to run. Um, now, we've been working with the high performance computing people in ULIC for some time and they keep, we keep learning tricks from each other and uh, they've now worked out how to make their, make their HPC model run in real time. So um, we're not unique, um, but I think in the next phase of the HPP, this is going to scale up to a multi-region model and we can't see any reason why this will not continue to be real time on Spinnaker, whereas I suspect that will be very difficult on HPC. So that uh, was a fairly significant milestone. We, we first published this model running on Spinnaker um, jointly with Ulich uh, more like 18 months ago, but that, at that time it was running with a 20 times slowdown. So um, getting it to real time uh, was significant progress. We have people modeling um, other sorts of details, so um, neuromodulators such as serotonin in these models, and some of these are modeling the difference between neural behavior um, in wake and sleep modes. Um, and and uh, uh, there are examples of, uh, of papers shown at the bottom here, uh, published on, on the serotonin models. Um, and, and so that's computational neuroscience, but we've also found a very useful collaboration in the more theoretical areas in the Human Brain Project. We're 
we're fortunate to be able to work with Wolfgang Massey's group at, at TU Graz. And, and uh, a number of interesting things have emerged from that and continue to emerge. So um, one piece of work that a, a PhD student did is on uh, using a stochastic spiking network to solve constraint satisfaction problems, where a familiar example is Sudoku. Um, and this network solves the hardest class of Sudoku problems in about 10 seconds, which is a lot faster than I can do it. Um, well, I'm not sure I can do it at all, actually. Um, but then I don't have the rules of Sudoku hardwired into my brain, which this network does. Um, this is using quite a lot of neurons and synapses, and it the same approach works for map coloring and icing spin systems. Um, it works for a, a subclass of constraint satisfaction problem. Um, it has to be a form of CSP where when you find the solution, you know you found the solution, Okay, which is true of problems such as those listed here. It's not true of, for example, the traveling salesman problem where you can only know you've got the optimal solution if you've done an exhaustive search. Um, but it's interesting. Um, also on the theoretical neuroscience side, uh, we've done quite a lot of work modeling structural plasticity. One of the merits of having the models on Spinnaker in software um, is that it's easy to change the neural models and the synapse models and it's easy after the event to add functionality such as the ability to support structural plasticity um, and, and this has uh, been shown um, pretty convincingly uh, learning from uh, visual inputs uh, how to form the connections behind them and a sort of visual example of this is um, you know, famous endless digits on the left being shown and uh, the network's learning through structural plasticity and you can kind of see that a representation of the digit is emerging um, in the connectivity structures that are happening underneath this. So uh, that, that's a quick sample of theoretical neuroscience. Um, the other direction we go in, because we're a real-time system, it's quite well suited to robotics applications. And uh, in the neurorobotics space, there have been um, a number of bits of work. Um, one here um, was looking at uh, how you understand signals coming through biological neurons, uh, uh, how you understand them to control prosthetics. And, and there's been a lot of work done here at, at the Auckland University of Technology in New Zealand um, using Spinnaker to help um, do the classification um, of the biological systems that they want to use to control prosthetics. We've also had Spinnaker interface to iCub, which is this humanoid robot um, developed by a, a big European project centered at the Italian Institute of Technology. And uh, this has been doing things such as looking at vestibular ocular reflex um, using Spinnaker and uh, cerebellum control. So there have been a range of things. I've just touched on some of them briefly here, um, but, but uh, they've enabled Spinnaker to contribute to neuroscience and neurorobotics in, in quite a number of directions. And of course, all of these activities um, inform each other in, in complementary ways. Now, Spinnaker itself is, uh, as I've said, uh, 10 years old in sort of technology terms. Um, and in the Human Brain Project, we've been developing a second generation system in collaboration with the Technical University of Dresden. And here we're um, aiming to ride on the progress technology has made in the last 20 years and, and simply by going to a more aggressive uh, process technology um, we can fit a lot more processes onto a chip and the current uh, version of Spinnaker 2 which is planned to be taped out towards the end of this year um, will have 152 um, ARM-based processing elements on it, um, more memory uh, but otherwise a very similar um, fundamental architecture. So we think uh, the architecture and the routing technology works very well in this domain. Uh, so we're sticking with that. Um, the fundamental design component of Spinnaker 2 is a quad processing element with four on processors on, 
and then you can see that most of the chip is tiled from this and this has been designed and fabricated um, on one prototype and we have a second prototype that's just gone to fab that's actually got all the major components of Spinnaker 2 on it but still on quite a small die and on a multi-project wafer to keep the cost down so that we can de-risk the big chip when that finally tapes out. Now Spinnaker 2 is benefited a lot from what we've learned from Spinnaker 1 um, and it has uh, a number of new features based on that experience. Um, firstly where we're staying very focused on optimizing energy efficiency and Spinnaker 2 has some quite uh, um, sophisticated electrical engineering on it including DVFS power management so that each of the 152 cores can uh, optimize its efficiency for its workload and we've demonstrated that we can do this at, at the level of the individual one or 0.1 millisecond time step switching the sort of voltage and frequency um, if the workload um, rises in that time step then the throughput can be switched up to cope with it um, we're increasing the memory sharing which on Spinnaker 1 is a bit messy um, on Spinnaker 2 we're making it very straightforward to share memory on the chip and uh, some of the algorithms we've used for example in the real-time cortical microcircuit will work much more efficiently with this kind of memory sharing. We're adding a multiplier accumulator so this chip will be good for conventional uh, neural networks for, for machine learning as well as for spiking networks and it'll support hybrid networks which are a combination of ANNs and SNNs and then this has a, a very high efficiency multiply accumulate throughput um, but we've also learned what are the key algorithms on the spiking network side and we're putting accelerators in for those um, the two key accelerators are, are for computing exponentials uh, which come up a lot in the solutions of neural equations and also very high quality random number sources uh, we find we use a lot of random input into the neural models and high quality random sources are expensive to build in software um, but cheap in hardware so uh, we're putting accelerators on for those. Um, we're using NOC communication it's slightly different from Spinnaker 1 but um, similar in principle and the technology we're using which is a 22 nanometer um, fully depleted silicon insulator technology from Global Foundries um, has a very high variability out of manufacture and, and the adaptive body biasing here is something that, that automatically compensates for that variability and, and narrows the production spread to optimize the efficiency of the chip, um, make it much less dependent on uh, the particular process parameters. So if we look at what's on there, I've, I've talked about the Mac accelerator. Um, this is a, a 16 by 4 accelerator so it's not the sort of big matrix multiplier you find on um, standard artificial neural net accelerator chips. It's a much smaller um, matrix unit on each processing element. But when you remember that there's 152 processing elements, that gives you quite a lot of total Mac crunch across the chip. Um, and this will um, offload matrix multiplication and, and performing convolutions and such like from the processor itself. Um, and the kind of throughput we're seeing on the simulations and on the test silicon uh, is in the region of, of, of six teraops per watt. So it's, it's pretty much state of the art in terms of throughput and efficiency. The kind of interesting things we can do um, that we've shown with the Spinnaker 2 prototype chips. Um, one thing that I find particularly fascinating is, is, is this deep rewiring algorithm, which originally comes from TU Rats. Um, and, and this is showing really that the densely connected matrices that are traditionally used in artificial nets are really very inefficient solutions. Um, what this particular piece of work showed was that you can achieve state-of-the-art accuracy on, for, in this case, the MNIST benchmark with connectivity which is below 1%. So fewer than 1 in 100 synapses are actually contributing to the classification process. Um, and therefore, with sparse matrix operations, you can get 
much higher efficiency uh, by doing far fewer multiplications with pretty much the same result. So um, I want to leave a bit of time in the hour for questions and uh, this is my last slide. Um, just to summarize what I've been talking about, um, the Spinnaker machine itself has been 20 years in conception and more than 10 in construction now. There are in fact now over 100 machines uh, or boards with groups around the world. We achieved our million core target and of course we've had to learn a great deal about how to make a million core machine run 24 7 reliably but we're pretty much there now. The machine is there in service all the time which is very fortunate actually at the moment because uh, of course we're not allowed in the building um, so all of the group is working from home and fortunately this makes relatively little difference to us because um, the big machine just sits in uh, the main university building running reliably day after day and nobody needs to go in and touch it. In parallel with the work we've been doing developing Spinnaker, industrial AI has gone through this explosion of, of, of novel applications that uses a, a, an older form of neural net um, and of course has, has demonstrated its ability to deliver commercially viable results which spiking nets have not yet done but I sense a growing expectation that neuromorphics is going to contribute here somewhere and that somewhere may well be in the area of energy efficiency. And uh, while Spinnaker is certainly not the most efficient um, spiking neural network platform around, uh, True North and Lowehe have significantly higher um, energy efficiency statistics, um, it is still uh, the largest neuromorphic computing platform there is available and the most flexible because of its use of software. Um, so I think it still has a significant role to play as a research platform. When you don't know what you want, flexibility is very valuable. Once you know what you want, you can probably go away and build it significantly more efficiently. Um, but until that point, flexibility has a very high value. And uh, Spinnaker 2 will... Um, be very similar to Spinnaker 1 but about 10x better in terms of functional density and energy efficiency and so for example you will be able to put something that can support a network the size of an insect brain into a single Spinnaker 2 package uh, on a one watt budget into a drone um, so that will open up quite a number of exciting opportunities insects seem to fly themselves fairly well so we'll be able to put that kind of capability um, into a chip that you can afford in a drone's power budget. And uh, the graphic on the right here is just worth mentioning. Um, this is sort of showing various different approaches and um, comparing them on the basis of the energy uh, to pass one spike through one synapse. But it, so it's the energy per connection. And the winner at the bottom is biology, which works on about 10 to the minus 14 joules per connection. Uh, the loser at the top is a complex biological model on the supercomputer which consumes about one joule per connection. If you go to simpler point neuron models then you can get your standard computer down to about 10 to the minus four joules per connection. Spinnaker runs at about 10 to the minus eight. The brain scale system in the human brain project which is an analog wafer scale neuromorphic platform runs at about 10 to the minus 10 joules per connection, as do uh, systems such as Intel's Lowy He and, and IBM True North. So the best engineered systems are currently running at about 10 to the minus 10, um, four orders of magnitude to go before we start competing with biology. And at that point, I will stop what has been quite a strange experience of giving a presentation with nobody present. Um, and um, throw this open for questions. I'm proposing to do this uh, by closing the screen, sh the screen sharing so that we can start to see each other if we want to. Um, right, I think we're there. So yeah, please ask you your question to Steve directly. Maybe uh, uh, you can just um, raise uh, yeah. your name in, in the chat and, and I will just uh, so Gerd has a question, uh, I guess. So you can raise your hand also too, like, uh, so Gerd, please go on. 
Yes, Steve, very nice to see you. So a uh, very interesting talk and I very much enjoyed it. Um, so um, energy efficiency is extremely important in neuromorphic computing. And, and you very much pointed out to the fact that much of uh, the distinction between neuromorphic computing and AI is, is now fading. And, and so we have, uh, right, it's all about uh, accelerating the, 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 the compute. Um, but so then in terms of energy efficiency, um, right, if you look at uh, the, the cost for each uh, synaptic operation, right, or multiply cumulative as it is, is, is quantified in many AI applications, right, so that, that cost is really limited by the memory access more than the actual implementation of the, the processor that does the compute, right. Um, and um, so there have been processing in memory solutions, right, where the where the compute is directly tied to its memory element at, right, at the uh, very, you know, very fine fabric scale. Um, so, so here, do you see a, is there a progression for Spinnaker going towards really integrating then the processor and the memory at a very fine grain scale? Uh, uh, right, there have been memistors, there have been some other in uh, processing memory solutions right, that, that can really get memory close to to um, um, uh, processing, because uh, eventually, right, the cost of each each operation is then limited by the memory cost, and for DRAM, it's in the order of nanojoules or, or right upper upper hundreds of picojoules, and for uh, SRAM, of course, it, it's it's very low. It, it's it's in the order of, of femtojoules. So, so, um, uh, so what are your thoughts of of of, of how to push density and and uh, bandwidth for memory? access for in-memory compute, uh, processing in-memory compute. Yeah, so, so I mean, uh, of course you're right that the, uh, the cost of a, of a synaptic connection on a machine such as Spinnaker is, is probably dominated by the cost of accessing the DRAM because we, we store the synaptic data structures in the DRAM, which is the second, um, the, the second chip in the package. Mm -hmm. uh, and therefore, um, although we try and optimize, I mean, we, we use a sort of a compressed row storage of, of, of the sparse matrix uh, so that when we get an incoming spike, we fetch a row of connections rather than a single one. Um, but each one still has a significant energy cost. And, and, and that's part of the reason why, why Spinnaker is, is uh, significantly less efficient than, for example, Loewe and, and, and True North, both of which um, do that from on-chip memory. Um, I think um, the problem is, is if you want to retain the flexibility in, for example, the, the synaptic learning algorithm, um, then there's quite a strong argument for keeping, um, uh, keeping software having a role. And once software has a role, then your processing unit is, is fairly significantly large. Um, and, and it's hard to get the, the dimensions down to very small levels. Obviously, on Spinnaker, if we could hold the uh, synaptic data structures in on-chip RAM, then we would uh, get a significant energy advantage. And, we, we, and we, we can do that in some cases, or it's not part of our standard model at the moment, but one of the things that um, uh, Bernabe Linares Branco from Seville did with Spinnaker was he built a convolution net where he exploited the fact that all the filters in the convolution net share the same weight matrix. And so he could store that weight matrix in the local RAM um, close to the processor and, and get very high efficiencies and, and performance on that particular task. And that's something that I'm trying to encourage the team to look at doing again, because convolutional nets um, come up pretty often and quite important and at the moment we make a bit of a dog's breakfast of implementing them. Um, so, I, but I, th I think, um, I mean, where this is going, of course, is, 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 is towards uh, really quite different technologies for supporting the synapse. Um, if you support the synaptic information digitally on Spinnaker, we, we tend to have four bytes of data per synapse, okay? so. Um, and that includes the synaptic weight, it includes the compressed row representation expansion, it includes an individual per synapse delay, it includes synaptic type information and so on. Um, and, and 
if you have uh, four bytes per synapse and you want a million synapses on a core, um, you're at four megabytes of memory and you're already pushing what is feasible to implement on chip. And that's my, my original vision for Spinnaker was that we have embedded DRAM on the chip and we'd use right, quite slow but very wide access to this to access the synaptic stuff more efficiently. But for sort of practicality reasons, it turned out just to be more practical to use a standard DRAM on a, se on a separate chip and, and accept the hit um, as part of the price of the flexibility of doing this stuff in software. Um, but ultimately, of course, if you can um, implement your memory and some of your compute functions in a device such as a Memristor, um, then the gains will be huge. And there's a lot of work going on looking at novel device technologies that may form very interesting neural substrates in the future. But I would, and, and, and whilst I think that research is all extremely valuable, I still think we have to understand what it is we expect a synapse to do before we commit to a particular device because it happens to do it. Um, you know, until we know what we want, um, we don't even know if a memorister has the right characteristics or not. Um, and if you want to put a memorister in a context where you can tune its characteristics flexibly, then the overhead of the tuning almost completely eliminates the advantage you started off with. So, uh, so it's a rather long answer to your question. But <laughs> Thanks, Lizzie. That's great. Thank you. Uh, Steve, uh, could you comment on uh, how the uh, network differs between uh, Spinnaker and Spinnaker 2, in particular two sub-questions, will there still be a ternary cam for doing the routing and will there be, uh, what is the purpose of that seventh connection between the chips? So on on Spinnaker 2 that is the seventh connection. Yeah. Yes. Um, the seventh connection really is, is, is uh, six connections are required for the triangular mesh interconnect. The seventh connection gives you an additional route uh, to send information a much higher bandwidth to the host machine. Um, on Spinnaker 1, uh, we find that the host connection is, is a major bottleneck for a lot of, you know, a lot of jobs spend more time loading into the machine and extracting results from the machine than they spend running on the machine. Um, and, and so what we've tried to do with Spinnaker 2 is, is get a much higher I.O. performance relative to everything else. Um, I think, uh, and that's the, the primary role of, of that seventh link. It can also be used in some applications for connecting to peripheral devices in robotics, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, and and uh, we've talked quite closely with some of the robot Spinnaker users um, to see what they want and what would make their life easier. Because we're hoping that Spinnaker 2, you know, Spinnaker 1 was really designed for scalability with the objective of building a big machine. With Spinnaker 2, we're hoping to um, produce a device that's much more usable at a small scale as well as being scalable up to, up to a large machine and obviously robotics are, are a key application. Now in terms of the network, uh, I think you, I mentioned there was a difference in, in, in the network on chip. Yes. On Spinnaker 1 we have 18 cores and effectively there are two networks on chip. One network on chip is, is what we call the comms network which carries the packets from the IOs and from the processors um, through the router and then back out again. And there's a completely separate star network which allows all the cores to share access to the DRAM and the other system level peripherals. Um, on Spinnaker 2, that approach doesn't scale to the number of cores on the chip. And so on Spinnaker 2, um, what we've used is, is a rather more conventional knock. It's, it's a it's a square mesh knock, um, but with very high bandwidth. So um, the the people we're working with at Dresden uh, sort of had the, had this knock technology in their back pocket from some previous project, um, and, and so we're sending both the, act, the 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 major traffic to and from the DRAM and the Spinnaker packet traffic through the same knock on on the chip. Um, and and uh, that, in, that improves the efficiency of chip assembly a great deal because each of the quad processing elements is just tiled. There's no 
there's no global wiring at all on the chip. Okay, everything is just um, QPE abutting to QPE. So there's no global timing issue on the chip at all. There's no we don't have to do any timing analysis at the full chip level, um, which would be a nightmare if we did have to do it. Um, and, and but it also brings problems, and, and the problems are um, that um, th those two sorts of traffic, the Spinnaker packet traffic and the local on-chip SDRAM traffic have different natures. Effectively, the Spinnaker, um, Spinnaker packet traffic is, is a kind of real-time traffic, so you want guaranteed service. And the SDRAM traffic is, is more a best effort kind of traffic. Mm -hmm. and, and we're mixing the two together. And that's a kind of, um, that causes all sorts of headaches um, that we hope we're on top of. But um, we may we may yet be surprised. Um, I mean, the, the 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 basic characteristic of a knock is that effectively it's a FIFO communication channel um, with switches. Um, so if 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 it gets overloaded, then you get back pressure and it stalls. And in the Spinnaker two on chip knock, we just have to make sure that doesn't happen. Okay. So we have to we have to put in protocols, which means that traffic doesn't get onto the knock unless it knows it can get off at the other end. There's plenty of bandwidth in the middle, provided it doesn't congest. Will your uh, will your new chips uh, use a different form of uh, DRAM integration than what you did previously with just wire bonding? Um, yes, they'll they'll, they'll 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 actually use a much more boring. Um, they'll use separate DRAM chips on the circuit board. Um, I mean, we're going, Spinnaker 1 uses the early LPDDR mobile DRAM. Um, so it's dual data rate, um, but quite uh, quite modest performance. On Spinnaker 2, we're using LPDDR4, um, so much, much higher bandwidth. And we need it because we've you know, got 10x the number of processors, so we need at least 10x the bandwidth. Okay, thank you very much. We have a question by uh, Luis Pisha uh, that is asking, uh, do you want to ask your question yourself or uh, you want me to read it? Uh, I'm sure I can read it. Um, given the large gap in energy per computation between biological brains and simulated ones, do you think bi biological brains might turn out to be more like quantum computers than classical ones? Ah, okay. This is a question that's really more in the domain of philosophy than technology, I think, in, in my view. Um, there, there's, uh, there, 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 I mean, the answer is, I just don't know. Um, if you talk to neuroscientists, they, they are generally of the view that, um, that the sort of Newtonian view of the neuron as, as a device that processes inputs through very complex processes and generates outputs. Um, if you take that model and assemble enough of them in the complex and appropriate structure, then all the properties of the brain will emerge from that. Uh, but of course we don't know because nobody's yet done that. Um, there are uh, alternative views. I mean, there's the, the famous Roger Penrose Emperor's new mind view that you can't explain the capabilities of the biological brain on a, a, a purely Newtonian model. You have to in, in, introduce quantum phenomena. Um, I've talked to various particle physicists who just don't see that quantum phenomena can really work in the brain. It's at the wrong temperature and the scales are wrong. Um, so I hear conflicting views on this and as I say most neuroscientists um, don't subscribe to the view that you need to um, take recourse to some quantum magic. It's also the case that, that although there's still a gap between the most efficient engineered systems and the biology, it's not a huge gap anymore. Um, and, and it's not a gap that looks impossible to close. Um, you know, one, one of my simple views um, of this is if you look at um, the current engineered systems, they're all using um, signaling in the region of, I don't know, half a volt or a volt. And the brain uses a tenth of a volt. 
So if you go from a volt to a tenth of a volt, you get two orders of magnitude improvements in energy efficiency, right? That's, um, that's one of the standard laws of, 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 of computing systems. Um, so that geometrically is half the gap between a chip such as Lowy here and, and the biology. Uh, now, when you do that, the reason you don't, it's not easy to do in the engineered system uh, is that you're getting a bit down into the noise. Um, but the brain appears to be very noisy. So if we could understand the principles, we could engineer systems that worked uh, down at that level and use the same noise tolerance mechanisms that the brain uses that we don't really understand. Um, then those two orders of magnitude certainly look to be achievable. And I think if you got the sort of improvements that you get from going from digital to analog and in particular to bespoke devices, you probably find you could cover the other two orders of magnitude as well. So I don't see that gulf as being an impossible one to cross. It's just we don't currently know how to cross it either, either in terms of, of, of operating in the presence of noise or in, the, or in terms of device efficiencies. So, <coughs> next Thank we have a question. Oh, sorry. Uh, next we have a question from from Todd. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you. Hi, Steve. Um, what are the opportunities, challenges in implementing spiking back propagation methods in Spinnaker? So um, th this, of course, has been one of the great weaknesses of spiking networks versus artificial nets historically. Um, is that backprop is so effective in artificial nets. Now, of course, backprop is not biologically plausible, um, so we don't really like it. Um, we like local learning rules, not, not global ones. Um, but if you want to apply these networks in an engineering application, then having something that learns as effectively as backprop is, is, is very important. And um, what I would say here is that there are several ideas bubbling around at the moment um, that seem to uh, deliver to spiking networks uh, the ability to do gradient descent learning, which is basically what PACPROP is. Um, one of the ideas that we're actively working on and have actually got some uh, early demonstrations of is, is a technique that's, um, again, from TU Gratz called EPROP. Uh, and EPROP delivers to your spiking network an ability to learn through gradient descent. Um, whether it's as universal as conventional error backprop in artificial nets um, remains to be seen, but at least it's beginning. And it's not the only example. There have also been some algorithms, rather more complex ones, emerging from um, work at the University of Bern in Switzerland. Um, yeah, this is in Switzerland. Um, which also deliver gradient descent like behavior in spiking nets. So very early days, I mean, backprop has been established, um, I guess, since the 80s, so for 30 years or more. Um, these spiking network equivalents are only just beginning to emerge, but I think they're looking quite promising. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Okay, and then to finish with a question from Gordon Kruger or so. Yeah, hi, uh, and thank you. Uh, I'm interested in understanding a little more about where... Uh, I, I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not hearing Gordon. His voice is disappearing. Can you hear me now? That was better, yeah. Okay. Um, I'm intrigued by where you think... Well, so first off, if you look at, um, you know, artificial nets, uh, you could say that they really reduce spiking neural nets to a bulk model of what spiking neural nets do. Instead of looking at a spike, look at the frequency spikes, for example. I'm wondering where you see um, implementations of spiking neural nets that you've seen in all the people that have used uh, Spinnaker, where you don't think what they demonstrated could eventually be reduced to some kind of uh, bulk model for uh, activity model instead of a spiking model? Yeah, that, that's a good question. I mean, it, it is the case that you know, the standard interpretation of an artificial net is that the value, the activation coming out of a neuron represents the sort of mean firing rate of a neuron or maybe a bunch of neurons 
Um, so in some sense, it's, 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 it's going to a higher level of abstraction than the individual spike. Uh, the, the downside, of course, is that it's abstracted away all the temporal information that was present. And um, there's, there's growing evidence that in biology, um, spike coding isn't all about spike rate. Rates clearly um, are the encoding in some areas, particularly in the sensory inputs. Um, but in other parts of the brain, there's quite a lot of evidence that spike timing is important. And so there are, there are um, codes such as rank order codes, which uh, where every neuron spikes at most once, um, that have very high information carrying capability. Um, and, and they capture some of the temporal dynamics of the system as well. Now, um, I guess the, the, the question, you know, when you understand these things and you understand what the spikes are doing, can you then again raise the level of abstraction um, to something um, that doesn't involve spikes? Uh, I don't think we know at the moment. I think we can only really answer that question when we have pretty good uh, explanations of what's going on in, for example, um, the cortical microcolon circuit or something similar. And, and we're not there yet. Um, my suspicion is that if we can encode efficiently with single or few spikes, then we can build systems that are much more efficient uh, than the bulk coded ones. Um, we've been doing quite a lot of work recently on translating artificial nets into spiking nets. And, and if you simply do the obvious thing and translate the artificial net into a rate coded spiking net, which is something that you can do automatically using, for example, the SNN toolbox from Zurich, um, then you get a, a spiking net uh, that, that has the same function as the artificial net. So you can train the artificial net in TensorFlow and then make an equivalent spiking net, but you don't gain anything. And, and uh, the simple explanation as to why you don't gain is that what was a multiplication of the synapse in the artificial net, you've effectively converted into multiplication by repeated addition in the spiking net. And, and uh, multiplication by repeated addition, at least in a digital implementation such as Spinnaker, is less efficient than the original multiplication. But again, there are algorithms coming out of places like RATS that, that tr translate the activation into a different representation where the potential for energy gains is significant. Um, and if one could also begin to uh, add some information into the temporal dynamics, then I think you, you get a system that was potentially much more interesting. I think the real weakness of, of artificial nets is they've abstracted all the temporal information out. And, and in doing that, they've lost quite a lot of information. Thank you. Um, I, I guess I, as a follow-up, have you got any of the implementations of Spinnaker or any of the software running on Spinnaker, have you seen any of those implementations demonstrate something that could not be? I mean, do you have a, do you have a proof point that it can't be, there are some that haven't been uh, uh, reduced? I, I, we don't tend to work in a world where people are trying to do that reduction. I mean, for example, with, with the cortical microcircuit, um, the objective is to understand the principles of operation in the cortex. Now, it's fair to say at the moment, all we have is a model which reproduces the measurable biological spike rates in the different layers of cortex. Uh, it's not doing anything recognizable as information processing, but in the next phase of the HBP, there is an expectation that we'll begin to understand what the information processing role of that, uh, of that microcircuit is. Um, when we do that, then we'll be much better placed to say, is this something that can easily be abstracted? And I quite like to see an abstraction which was not just replacing spiking neurons with, with non-spiking neurons, but was actually uh, replacing the whole cortical microcircuit with a kind of function. Um, at that level of abstraction, of course, then we could run away with Spinnaker because we've still got software. We can model the function rather than the neuron. Um, and and, and you know, who knows where that might lead, but we're, we're not there yet. Thank you. You're welcome.
So thank you, Steve. I uh, don't think we have any other questions uh, for now. Okay, that's fine. I, I'm, I, I, you know, people can find my email address fairly easily if they don't know it. I'm, I'm happy to uh, pick up on anything that people want to ask. It's an interesting experience giving a seminar with no people. Um, <laughs> Well, only virtual people, so uh, I'd be interested to know how it works for you. Uh, but anyway, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Very Thanks, much. Steve, for a great talk. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Steve. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.